It's my great pleasure to join you today at the Riga Graduate School of Law. I'm sorry that it can't be a physical visit. I would like to have been with you, but of course the COVID rules have made that impossible and instead I'm in a small studio in Vienna. I have been to Riga 10 years ago. I visited the Graduate School of Law and I had the bad luck to be there when the Icelandic ash cloud descended. That meant, and this was the pleasure of course, that instead of spending a night or two in Riga, I spent basically a whole week. That was a week that's very memorable for me. I got to know the city a little bit. I, I toured the streets, I visited the museums, and one of the abiding memories I've taken away, apart from the beauty of the city, is the extent to which the scars of war are still visible. I saw that on streets, but I also saw it by visiting museums and seeing the very well told stories of atrocity after atrocity inflicted on the territory. I was reminded that the Second World War was an epoch changing event in the history of our continent. Its horrors, its atrocities triggered the building of a new Europe, a Europe grounded in democracy, rule of law, at the very heart of which, the guarantor of which, is the promotion and protection of human rights. That commitment to rights at the heart of democracy has been in the story from the beginning. You see it in the United Nations Charter. We see it, of course, in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with its so moving and powerful Article 1, all people are born free and equal in dignity and in rights, and we see it in the construction of treaties that emerged in the following decades. The treaties, the human rights treaties of the United Nations, but also the regional treaties, including here in Europe, the crown jewel of which, of course, is the European Convention on Human Rights. Here in Europe, within the EU, we also see the same story played out, an ever increasingly rights-based, rights-committed institution, with at its heart, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which celebrates the 20th anniversary of its negotiation just this year. We've achieved so much that already back in 1979, Pope John Paul II was able to say at the UN General Assembly that human rights is modernity's greatest achievement. Now, human rights may be our greatest achievement, but never has any achievement been put under more pressure a more threat than the system of human rights. Throughout its history, uh, the levels of abuse have been intolerable and unacceptable. However, in the last decade, I would suggest things have somehow got worse. The levels of abuse have carried on, but with them, we have seen a willingness by some, including people in high office, to repudiate the system, to say, if human rights gets in my way, then human rights gets out of the way. All of this came to a head in 2020 with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have never seen a greater, more widespread assault on human rights than is the case right now, not just, of course, in Europe, but right across the world. Perhaps most dramatically and disturbingly of all in 2020, the inequalities of our society have been laid bare. We now see in a way that is full center, that is undeniable, the extent to which our societies are deeply unfair. Look at the situation of Roma, some 6 million Roma living in the European Union. They are in 2020 experiencing a perfect storm of human rights abuse and deprivation. Look at the situation of Jews, a considerable number of whom say things are so bad that they want to emigrate. Look at the issue of migrants, those seeking asylum and how we treat them at our external borders. So we're in a moment of crisis, but let's use this moment of crisis as an opportunity for renewal. Let's grab 2020 uh, so that we can rebuild uh, our Europe, so that again, human rights is its beating heart. I would suggest three things. In the first place, we need to recommit uh, to the culture of human and fundamental rights. And one of the ways in which we can do that is through the upcoming conference on the future of Europe. Because perhaps of COVID, we don't hear so much of it. But when that conference rolls out in the coming months and into next year, it, will, it should be of epochal significance. And it can be such if we make it such. Second, we have to invest in ever strengthening the architecture 
for the protection of human rights. Two things here. The first is, uh, keep an eye on the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, the EU entity that I have the honour to direct. Uh, it can play a bigger, deeper, more impactful role within our societies. And again, it can only do that in partnership with the legal community and with all those who care passionately about human rights and about democracy. But the second dimension of the architecture that I would mention today are the interesting initiatives in the European Union, such as, for example, to strengthen the oversight of rule of law, on the other hand, and to make the disbursement of EU funds dependent on respect for fundamental rights, on the other. Now, all of these developments are very much still growing and embedding themselves. Let's watch them, let's engage with them to make sure that they land to the best possible effect. And then the third and the final dimension of reinvigorating our commitment is recommitting ourselves passionately and, 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 and full square in respect for, in standing up for the rights of the most vulnerable in our societies. We are only as good as, our human rights systems are only as effective as, our democracy is only as true as its willingness, its ability and its engagement in standing up for those most at the edges of our societies. I thank you and I wish you all the best for the conclusion of this event and in your work.